Now, Jeff still believes in paper, which confuses me. Just because the technology is old doesn't mean it's bad. It just exactly. means it's old. Proven. Stop picking on my paper, both of you. No, I... No, he's supporting I, your paper. Sorry, please. I have a fountain pen in my pocket. Oh, <laughs> you and I are going to get along great. I have a large collection. Wow. I do, I do fountain pens? Yes. Wow. I do math and... You do math oh. and pens? Yes. All right, I got to go. In four, <laughs> three, two... Company presents a truly terrible podcast. Welcome to Nonsense episode number 28. I'm Jeff Parker. I'm CJ Little. This is our take on the week's business tech and entertainment headlines. This time, we're chatting with Dr. John Ehrenberg, Chief Mission Architect for Science and Robotic Exploration for Northrop Grumman Space. Yes, the James Webb Telescope Guy. And you can just call me John. I'm beyond psyched to be able to talk to John today. I want to say a huge thank you to Ron Niv and his wife, Connie Chestnut, who works with Dr. Ehrenberg at Northrop Grumman. Shortly after I told Ron about this podcast, he put the wheels in motion to have Dr. Ehrenberg on and we are so so grateful yes thank you connie thank you connie and ron for making this happen it is embrace your geekiness day which is perfect for us i feel like we've done that (laughs) i feel like we've achieved that by having john here today i should have wore my binary (laughs) shirt if you are unable to embrace your geekiness today you are dismissed (laughs) it's also national french friday are you a french fry fan oh absolutely what's your favorite french fries in town other than the ones i make you make french fries oh yeah of course you do Uh, i love to cook be honest i like mcdonald's well sure everybody does everybody uh, the problem with McDonald's fries is the half-life. They're really good when they're hot. Absolutely. They're okay when they're warm, when they're cold, they're just no, terrible. No, they're It's a highly designed product, and it's perfect. <laughs> it but there's lots, of good, there's lots of good ones around town. Give me your top three. Islands. Islands, yeah, yeah. Which, of course, the bottomless feature is is a, is a chief. Mm-hmm. My favorite deli in Santa Monica and Froman's is is good. Oh, yeah. And then uh, the one I haven't had. The next I always, one. always leave room. I, I, like, like, that. I like that. I like, I like that. that. We'll round table this. I was not actually expecting Dr. Ehrenberg to be here. <laughs> he is actually a little bit early, so I'm... I'm excited he is here, so we're just going to include him in the beginning of the show. How's your week going? I mean, we made it through the work week, and now I'm on the, the, the work weekend, and so I get to do whatever I want, like things like this, and the fun part of my job, the fun problems, and I don't have to do the training and all the rest of it, and I can go home and do some math problems and pay attention to my wife. In and, pen. I've heard you do them in cats. pen. cats, yes, I do. <laughs> all of them in pen. Yep. How's your week going, CJ? Well, I'm not doing my math problems in pen, mm-hmm. so I, that, I'm not as well as it could be. Yep. I'm just glad I've got my voice back after the last episode, after my allergy attacks. Uh, I did not not sleep a wink last night. Oh, you were so excited. You know how kids don't sleep when they're going to go for their first day of school? Yeah. Or, oh, yeah. I remember. people before they get married, they don't sleep before their wedding because they're so excited. This was my night for like yeah. before <laughs> that. Yes. I grew up in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. We had a World Book Encyclopedia my parents bought. We had the, the 1968, the 50th, the beautiful green and white with that's the gold what that's what we had i read it cover to cover and, wow. but memorized literally memorized everything about planets and stars i was obsessed i loved to read that i wouldn't read any other books that my parents brought scared the death out of me. <laughs> wait so how do you guys feel about pluto because that's been a hard fall now a plutoid Pl- pluto's very emotional right my uh, my family my late father worked for the discoverer uh when he was a a soldier at oh, really? White Sands, and wow. so he was emotionally attached to that discovery as a planet. The scientist in me understands that things need to be properly classified, sure. and the original classification was not, not correct. It. We did not understand sure. the yeah. solar system. We still don't. Sure. But we're getting better. But we're getting better, and, and in fact, James Webb is going to help yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. I think it's a natural evolution, but I also think it's very telling of uh, people in their times that they that they hold on to so these kinds had, of emotional attachments. So we had the same encyclopedia. Mm-hmm. When Carl said book Cosmos came out. Mm-hmm. I went to our local bookstore and got the guy, literally got the clerk to cut the box open and took the first one out of the box. Was that a big deal for you too? Let's see, that came out later when I was in school and, and, and busy studying physics. Okay. So, so I, right. I bought Less it when I had you. the... Less for you. Because I was otherwise occupied. Okay. Also, I grew up in Northern California. Many of the dads of the kids at my school were employed at Aerojet. Mm-hmm. And so, you know what Pinewood Derby is? Oh, absolutely. The, the cars yes. that race down the track all the dads were literally rocket scientists yes and i came in my dad was not a rocket scientist i b- had my blocky horrible pinewood sure. derby thing that i made theirs went down the track five times before mine got out the sure. gate yeah it was amazing but the cool thing was they all like took me aside and said you know here's try this next time sure. do this next time yeah. it was well, amazing it's similar in in santa monica at the time there was lots of scientists 
parents and very techy dads and, and quite a few moms, in fact, in my Cub Scout pack. The parents made a deal that the kids were going to do that. That's a good deal because literally the kids, except me, because I had actually made my car, the kids weren't even in the room. Sure. It, this yeah. was dads racing against dads, and sure. it was fun. That's a whole different thing. Yeah, no, no. That's a whole different thing. <laughs> that would be fun now. Ehrenberg or Arenberg? Ehrenberg. 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 Well, you, you see A-R-E and people think R. Like, it's Ehrenberg. That's how, that's how we pronounce it. That's, how we, that's the one I care about. <laughs> That's the one, one I care the about. the way my parents taught me how to say the name. So that's, we, uh, where, where are the Ehrenbergs from? Actually, my father's family's from Chicago, Milwaukee. But back Been, before that. We hail from Europe, but actually several stops. The current Ehrenbergs, and it's actually spelled several different ways, yeah. re-immigrated from England after Eastern Europe. Way back in time, family was largely, as I understand it, innkeepers. In fact, there's still an hmm. Ehrenberg hotel chain in Europe. Oh, oh cool. Great. And people got out of uh, Lithuania and settled in England, and then a number resettled in the, in the States in the 19th century. The center of gravity of the Ehrenberg family is in Chicago, Milwaukee area. It's a great area. My father was one of the, the adventurers, the one pioneers the that, broke free. that broke free and, you know, wasn't in a family business and yeah. went and did other things. Just thought, I'm getting out of this cold weather. He got out of the cold weather. He proudly said he was from Chicago, even though he had lived in Southern California, you know, four times longer than sure, he was sure, sure. <laughs> But anyway, the seven-year-old inside the 60-year-old Jeff is very excited to be here today. Typically at this point, we'll look at some headlines in the tech and science news. Okay. So, so have you signed up for Instagram threads yet? I know what it is. I'm, yeah. Are you I'm, a big social media guy? No. Social media came out. We you know, we were counseled not, you know, from our security, not to do it. I, sure. Quite frankly, I spent enough time behind the screen. Yeah. 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 I did sign up for Twitter because that was part of my job promoting web from back yeah. in the day. But I use it a little bit. You're using it for work. I'm using it for work and then I'm a little old fashioned that my social network is, is phone calls and meeting people in, in sure. person. Let me just say something interesting about, about threads. Interesting to me. Mm-hmm. They're using Activity Pub, which they're is using. the open standard for, for social media. I'm sure if they're using cool. Activity Pub. They're saying they're they plan to Activity use it. Pub. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so we, what, what Jeff's talking about here is uh, threads from Meta. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure they stood this thing up in like six weeks. I do not think they've been working on this for months. Wow. I think they looked at the dumpster fire over at Twitter and said, this is an opportunity for us to capitalize. We've got all the infrastructure. We've got all the engineers. If anybody could do it, these yeah. are the guys who could do it quickly. And what's amazing to me, like I think the real headline here is you've got a, a brand who doesn't have the best of acceptance amongst users right now, right? They've made some missteps, and this could be the thing that saves them. Like this could be the thing. Maybe that, wait, wait till you see the video. I'm going to post in the show notes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Look, I mean, you're you're picking amongst the other, the, you know, the, the various evils. But I think this could be uh, this could be an interesting save. We'll see. I had like a day on on Threads where it's like me and ten thousand other people for about a minute. <laughs> now, <laughs> now it's now it's two million. Now it's thirty million. It's now the now fastest it's, growing app ever. They started on Wednesday by Sunday they had over a hundred million accounts it's been a fun absolutely, absolutely amazing. a fun clip the other thing about threads that we that we should br- just quickly mention is uh, Elon Musk is already suing them I know <laughs> you stole our engineers no you actually fired half of them <laughs> they're still good engineers as it turns out trade secrets I yeah. think there are, are actually any trade secrets this doesn't seem like anything that yeah. this is as plain vanilla doing, as it gets it's a database and do, front doing end. A Sterlin less than 140 is not a trade secret right Elon. yeah right yeah I, well not, meta has come out and said that they have not used any Twitter engineers on this Zuckerberg has never lied to He's us never before. Lied. He's never lied. So social media is not your ballywick. No. Good man. Telegram has become a window into the war. Yes. Yeah. Telegram I, is a messaging service. Yeah. It's like Signal. It's like It's not whatever. like Signal. That's the problem. Well, the encryption's not. No. The encryption's not. I still don't trust Telegram at all. There have been too many you stories. Don't trust, you don't trust the encryption of Telegram. I don't trust the encryption nor the you people You shouldn't. That you operate. shouldn't trust the encryption of Telegram. Yeah, yeah, of course. Kids don't roll your own. I mean, there have been, been accounts of people in a one-to-one conversation having read receipts sent for things they didn't open. That yeah, should yeah, concern yeah. you. Everybody on the ground in, in Russia and Ukraine use Telegram. And to some degree, you get to see what those people are thinking. Pr- Prigov. What's his name? I can, I can never pronounce it. Wagner. Yeah. yeah, he was like, uh, he went back to pick up apparently five guns. And he's supposed to be exiled to Belarus. And then there's a video of him going back to Russia to pick up like five <laughs> guns. I'm like, what? Why don't you send like an Uber for that? So there's clearly something else afoot. <laughs> Uber gun? <laughs> Uber gun. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't familiar with that. go back to pick up five guns. Anyway. So, so nobody there. picked him up. I mean, is this just all a political ruse? They don't, they really actually no are idea. getting along? I, I don't think they're, I don't think they're I getting mean, along. I mean, that's crazy. Getting along seems like a bit of a stretch to me. <laughs> He's Putin's former caterer. Yeah, I mean, it's right. something like that. Yeah, yeah. something yeah. like that. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. why Putin trusts him. Well, trust him. Because he, no he makes the good mac and cheese. Yeah, totally. <laughs> You think Putin orders a lot of mac and cheese? I'm sure he does. think it's high on the list? He's like, I could have the Actually, no. Having seen him shirtless, he, he probably doesn't order any, any mac, mac and cheese. cheese yeah. Right. If you saw me shirtless, you'd realize I only order mac and cheese. A flying car prototype just got an airworthiness certificate from the FAA. Nah, this is super exciting. This is a tiny car. We talked about last week, yeah. we talked about an air taxi. Mm-hmm. The Joby Air Taxi. The Joby yeah. Air Taxi. Are you familiar this with this? Air taxis are big development. 
yeah. Yeah. activity, right? This small, is a, small a one aircraft. or two person car that has a road range of 200 miles and a flying range of 110 miles, which is remarkable to me that it's, it's that close. Yeah. It seems like it would take so much more energy to get in the air. Vehicle is going is expected to sell for around three hundred thousand dollars each. Are you going to get one? Probably wait. You probably wait <laughs> probably. for like, for the second gen. Yeah, yeah. John's like I don't want to be the early adopter. I'm not yeah. going to be the early adopter on the flying car. You want to wait? For, you want to be like three gens on that? This, this isn't an iPhone. No. Yeah. Like when it crashes, it it crashes. You really don't yeah. want to be wrong. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, that's not certified something. as a low speed vehicle, which means it won't be able to go faster than twenty five miles an hour on a paved yeah. road. Mm-hmm. You got so much less stuff to deal with as an AI in the air than you do on the ground. For now, yes. Also, the Joby is takeoff and landing is fairly quiet, and it's quiet flying over. It's like, what's your comparison? We're quieter than an F-14. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, guys. <laughs> like, yes. While true, there's still some room for improvement. The majority of my cars sound like that. <laughs> my neighbors are just like, oh, he's home. You have to drive cool cars. I drive some nice cars. Are, are, of oh, course, are you a car guy? Of course oh, you do. You yeah, have to be a car I'm, guy. Well, I live in Southern California. Yeah, of course, right? I'm a car guy. Yeah. But also, be, you're, you're engineer-minded. You, you've yeah, gotta, that's so got to like, be something that lights I, you I up. I do like a well-engineered car. Absolutely. Ooh. Are you going to tell us, give us a hint what you like? I grew up driving Volvos. I own an Audi now. I like it. It's very comfortable to drive yeah. in. German engineering is great. Although I get to rent a lot of other oh, great cars. Yeah, sure, and so ones. compared to the variance in car quality when I was growing up and as a teenager, which oh, well, you know yeah. was an adventure, whether they turn on or not. Of course, of course. <laughs> they're sure. far more yeah. reliable, ve- all very comfortable. The cheapest, crappiest car money can buy these days pretty much is reliable. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. That's that's such a huge advance in, in cars. If your interest is in getting from point A to point B, they pretty much do that now. Yeah. Huh. Software. I mean, Although the car my, my father gave me after I graduated college in the 1972 Datsun 1200 was oh. was fun. I could I could repair it with a C-clamp or duct tape or whatever it sure, took. Sure. And that car just But drove. you can't, you can't, your, your current cars you can't repair yourself? You don't flash oh, no. your own chips? Oh no, I mean you go and raise the hood and it's a solid it's a big black box. Right, big black box. Right, yeah. right. I know when another engineer has said don't touch this unless, <laughs> yes, you, know, no, it's unless, you, unless you know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially when your Audi has like three levels of plastic you have to take off and each one says do you really know what you're doing? And yeah. you're like mm, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very clear that the three fluids that you're allowed to put in the in the Clearly car marked at the front. Your Audi probably doesn't have a dipstick. No, no, modern and cars don't. And it at took first me a I was grumpy about that. Then I was like, oh, you have some old cars. Yeah. Do you have old cars? Are you a collector of any sort? Not of cars. I don't stamps. have. Stamps. You still collect stamps? I have stamps. What got yeah. you into collecting stamps? My father and grandfather did it. You're a philatelist. I am a philatelist. I mean, Is that a, a, a stamp collector? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Today I learned. It's a big fancy name for stamp collector. <laughs> what were your other hobbies as a kid? I was in the Boy Scouts. Played sports. Sports, stamp what collecting. Sports, what was your sport? Little league and soccer, yeah. and then track and field, and then I actually picked up powerlifting oh, wow. in graduate school. And, and you still up, do that? I still train. I won the state championship a bunch wow. of times. I won the nationals a couple of times. Got to go to the world championships. Yeah. So have like you hung sports. Out with our our ex governor. I, I have seen him in the gym. I'm not personally acquainted, but sure. he's easy to recognize. That's, yeah, he's he's not hard to miss. <laughs> it was always the pro- my problem with the movie Terminator was. If you were going to make a Terminator, you wouldn't make him look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Sure. You'd make him blend in. Blend in. Totally. Right? Not yeah, not. but then that ruins the story. Yeah, that, that was worth the story. It's, in hard that. To raise yeah, funding. Totally. it's hard to raise funding for my version of the movie, isn't <laughs> That's it? That's right. <laughs> the beige Terminator. Okay, enough of our headlines. Up next, Dr. John Ehrenberg, chief engineer for the James Webb Telescope, is here. Now we're actually going to talk some James Webb. Are you okay if we start before James Webb? Sure. Okay, because there's things I want to know about leading up to James Webb, if that's good with you. Okay, and you can call me John still. We are back with Dr. John Ehrenberg from Northrop Grumman Space. Now, you've got at least three titles that I've been able to find online. Which one's the right one? I'm the Chief Mission Architect for Science and Robotic Exploration. That is my current title. And now you've previously worn the hat of uh, Chief Engineer for Space Missions. I was Chief Engineer for Space Missions prior to that. The new title is a small evolution and changing organizations. And then prior to that, I was the Chief Engineer for North. I feel like you can't get much higher than Chief Mission Architect. I am responsible for developing new ideas, new missions expanding our product line, yeah. uh, being creative, talking to scientists, uh, leveraging what I've learned, my creativity, my ability to build teams yeah. to develop new missions and new opportunities. So it, both it's, it's good for science and it's good for business. It sounds like a lot of fun too. It is a lot of fun. It's a, a lot, lot of work. work and it's the kind of challenge I like. Yeah. I like doing new things. I don't mind being told 
what needs to be done. My personality is, please do not tell me how to do it. You yep. know, I learned that early. My mother, uh, my late mother, taught me how to cook at an early age, and I liked to cook. When I was an adult and, and married, I would have my mother over quite frequently for dinner, and one day I was cooking something she had never even heard of, and when she was over my shoulder saying, oh, you're not doing this right, <laughs> Get I, out I, of I said, mom. mom, go go talk to your daughter-in-law and play <laughs> yeah. with the cat. Get out the wooden spoon, and smack then her on it, the wrist. And then it, I never did that. <laughs> Much better son than that. <laughs> Good. I politely suggested that she would have more fun, Excellent. but that was my realization yeah. that that's my personality type. Like any job, you want to lean towards things yep. that emphasize your personality type. So, What's, you know, one of the things cooking has also taught me is it's not only a creative act, it's also an act of engineering. Yep. You know, the fundamental requirement is get everything on the table at one time, hot or cold or in the right condition. Yeah. This is not easy. But yeah. that's not the science part of it. That's the, that's no, the that's, business part that's of it. The, that's the, the organization that's the, that's part the, of it. And that's a big part of what we do as engineers yeah. is all the parts ready to go at the right time with the right design you know, made in time, set back and under all, understand all that. And so it's given me a deeper insight to understand how profoundly human the act of, of engineering is. And it doesn't matter if it's as simple as a, yeah. a tuna fish sandwich lunch or, or, as com or as complicated as something like James Webb. Can I ask about some of the legacy uh, NASA's great observatories? Sure. Like Hubble, Compton, Chandra, what are, what, what are they? Tell so, me what they are. So Hubble is a visible ultraviolet with a little bit of infrared. It's perhaps the most famous, soon to be the second yep. most famous space telescope in in history stop for a second because we went out and, and did a little maintenance mission on it there have been several servicing missions to change instruments it's uh -huh. designed to be serviced what is what is the orbit tell me what it's in low is. earth orbit okay. so it's shuttle accessible right very low earth orbit it's actually technically still in the atmosphere which is wow. why it may have to be reboosted or brought down because it won't burn up in the atmosphere can it boost itself can we no. refuel it no We've there's got no a... propulsion okay so someone's got to go up so and that's and... what the shuttle did right yeah. it went and the astronauts did the maintenance and in some cases zhuzhing, cleaned it up and we'll then, the oil. And then pushed it up and what's the, its expected lifespan it depends on solar activity but yeah. i believe it's expected to last into the 30s wow without okay. reboost and then yeah. the nasa's signed a space act agreement to maybe get it reboosted and we contributed some ideas to that and so that's certainly being looked at it's a, it's a significant asset for for science yeah. i'm gonna ask a dumb, dumb question it's mm -hmm. one mirror one piece mirror it's a it's a monolithic mirror it's okay. it's the same size as the hooker telescope on mount wilson so it's a hundred inch telescope it's the same size and in fact you know edwin hubble used the hooker telescope to do his universe changing work in the early 20th century uh -huh. uh, here on the edge of That's this cool. little california village los angeles it's a pretty big telescope it's 2.4 meters now the, but uh, the actual the actual mm -hmm. hubble compared to james webb is it's how much heavier so because i'm guessing so, parts so, get lighter and smaller with time Part of Webb's legacy, its 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 underlying genetics, was it had to be a revolutionary design because the the revolutionary science demanded a much larger telescope. When you say much larger, do you mean the the actual mirror? Yeah. So the collecting area of the mirror is about seven and a third times larger. Wow. Hubble is a two point four meter diameter. We like to say uh, Webb is six point five. So the area goes as the the square of that ratio. It's yeah. about seven, a little bit larger than seven. Explain to me the limitations. It's because there's only so much loading space in the rocket that takes it out. I like to call this the, the tyranny of the fairing. There's only so much mass you can get off the ground, and there's only so much volume. So it depends on how you arrange the pieces. So in the case of Hubble, it's a basically a cylinder, cylinder fit in the space shuttle. That's roughly a five meter, equivalent to a five meter fairing, give or take an inch. Sure. And, and so the fixed mirror essentially sits in the, in the bottom, if you will, of that cylinder with its primary optical axis located parallel to the the long axis of the cylinder and that limits how much collecting area you can put in and and you you can maybe tilt it and get a little bit bigger and a little bit different shape yeah. but you can't get radically larger to collect the the light from the early universe and to resolve the foreground to be able to sort out where the photons are coming from so these fantastic pictures of the early universe with all the galaxies you got to separate them that requires size part of the departure from previous designs for normal incidence telescopes was to break the primary mirror up into uh, individual smaller mirrors and make the primary mirror deployable. Which sounds like a whole other way of thinking. It sounds like you kind of have to relearn telescopes. It was a revolution in engineering. It's not the only segmented telescope. The 
ground-based Keck telescopes were a, uh, a harbinger. If you plot, and I've got a plot of the largest telescopes over time from the beginning, 1609, the, the, the aperture, largest aperture rises very rapidly, and then it rolls over in the 19th century and goes up quite, kind of slowly through the 20th century because they were all monolithic mirrors. Right. Yeah. With the invention of the a segmented telescope in the late 20th century, that slope, that rate of increase is much, much steeper. Sure, sure. Collecting a lot more light. A lot more light. Astronomy is absolutely technologically limited. It's limited by the size of the tools that can be built for the available resources. So having to not cast and, and move around a 10 or a 20 meter primary makes the mirror easier to manufacture. Yeah. And certainly with modern control systems and computer controlled systems, you can actually actively maintain a larger, more complex telescope. And now I interrupted you. We were talking mm -hmm. about the uh, NASA's great observatories. And we were just getting through a few of them. Let's let's continue with the list. Sure. So there's, there's of course, Hubble that everybody knows about. Yeah. There's Chandra, which is the X-ray mission. That was actually my first assignment, which was a complete accident. Uh, at, <laughs> a happy uh, at, accident. At, it was a very happy accident. At, tell uh, us. The, at, tell at, us. My actual academic background is as a laser engineer. My, my PhD oh, okay. is actually, first of all, it says engineering, but my major was quantum electronics or laser engineering. Was uh, there an EE major when you went to school? I was or asked whether I want my, my degree to say engineering engineering or EE because they were changing it over. And oh, I so said, you uh, were right at the changeover. I was over. at the cusp and Got I it. said, no, I wanted to say engineering. And I would love to be able to tell you honestly that it was foreshadowing that I knew what I was going to do. Sure. No, of course that's not. completely wrong. I wanted to say that because that's what it was going to say when I started. And I like to finish things sure. as I start them. It did turn out to be incredible foreshadowing, but you don't know. That's kind of the fun of, of life. Of life. Right. So I was hired and I had this genetically perfect match for a job. So there was a, a, a problem with a specific subsystem in a specific material, and I had procured and tested and developed Hired, hired it. by whom? So when I was hired by TRW to solve this specific problem, it's because I had a lot of experience in that exact material with that exact problem at Hughes working for a different customer. You were the guy. I was the guy because I was young enough and cheap enough to put on the problem. Sure. And you knew it. And, you knew and, it. and I, and I knew it. who built the stuff, and I knew where to go get it, and at least how to start working on the problem. So I literally showed up on my first day of work. The guy that hired me isn't there. There's a note that says, sorry, I'm not going to be there, but I've gone off to go work for NASA to lead a study. Oh, boy. The new department manager said, what were you hired for? And when I told oh, him, my. he said, oh, that's going to be a problem. That contract hasn't been signed. Why don't you come back tomorrow? I'll have something for you to do. 1.30, 2 o'clock on my very first day at work, I'm driving home. Next day, I get introduced to a gentleman who would become my longest working colleague and says, hi, I hear you're going to help us with this x-ray telescope. I'm thinking to myself, I, don't, I have no idea how this works. <laughs> and as they, as they were explaining how it worked, I, I thought he had not in his right mind. Sure. I went home and worked out the physics. And yes, of course, it worked exactly as it was described. And it was my impression that yeah. was wrong. What was supposed to be a three-week assignment while we waited for the other contract to be signed turned into almost nine years. The first contract was serious, never signed. Serious learning curve. Serious learning curve. And you have to be, you have to be someone who loves learning curves. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and I was hired for a very small, specific job, and I would sit in a meeting, and if nobody else volunteered to solve a problem, I would think to myself, "How hard could that be?" And sure. I'd stuck up my hand. A lot of times they weren't that hard. Sometimes they were really hard, really hard. Yeah. A lot of times the problems sounded hard, and when you decompose them, they weren't. Right. Because a lot of times people were just asking the wrong question. Yeah. And yeah. didn't have enough time to think about it. And other times they sounded easy, and they turned out to be wicked hard. That's how you build these big, complicated things. You've got to get in the weeds and right. figure it out. Do the math, as, as, as everybody likes to say. Is there and, anyone, can I just interrupt you a second? Is there anyone in the org chart above you who is in the weeds? Or at, at that point above you, does it just become corporate? No, my, my, my job is to decide when somebody, a senior person needs to get in the weeds and when it will oh, work out. Oh, but they will. They will. You do have people who will. Oh, I, I've got lots of other colleagues from other specialties. And when we have a big problem, everybody helps. A lot yeah. of brains. Even and sometimes a manager might have in his his or her background specific experience that's directly relevant and so you go get them to help yeah. right at that point you get everybody you need because mission success is job one sure in your org is that all indexed in your brain or do you have like a system that you go to when you have a specific problem to find the person it's kind of a list in my head yeah. or knowing who to ask and and, to know, and yeah. you know everybody has their their own personal
personal mental Rolodex. Yeah. And sometimes, because a lot of the problems are new, you know, they're not identical, but they're, they're similar and you get a feel and you say, okay, I need I need somebody like this and somebody like this and somebody like this. And, and sometimes even the best teams are just arbitrarily thrown yeah. together. And you get lucky and sometimes you don't. That's right. The people part of the, the business. And so you got to get the right chemistry and the right intellectual mix yeah. or the right leadership or the right sense of fun or the right sense of whatever it takes to get the job done. But by and large, engineers are very optimistic, want to help. They will do the best they can. Engineers as a whole are, are don't have a reputation for being social animals. <laughs> I think you are doing I think, what you're doing. You have no choice. No, it's, it's a highly social activity. I teach a class for some of the professional societies, and I literally have a slide in my class that says the people are the system. Yeah. The web works because all of the thousands of people that worked on it animated it with, with our efforts to make it successful from the originators to the last person to touch it to the managers, the administrators, people like Connie who manage the money, yeah. our contract administrators, even the lawyers, the scientists, the technicians, yeah. everybody did their part, literally animated this, this group of inanimate pieces, put them in the right order, wrote all the right code, and now it's this amazing machine that you can type a few commands on a computer console in Baltimore. At John Hopkins? Is at that John the... Hopkins, where the management center is. At some time later, you get the raw data that turns into the amazing images and science that come out of it. They can whip this thing around it at, at, with just a very little notice if there's something going on. Right. Like 48 hours, you can change yeah, the, the direction. It depends on, what, on when the regular fuel context. There's to that, though, right? There is. How but, much, but, how much but, fuel, but how some much fuel of is up there? So that we had to have a requirement for, for twice the required lifetime, so 11 years of fuel. And that's that, if the John Hopkins people don't do any, like, joyriding. They're not no, whipping I, that thing no, around No, no, no. Actually, actually, when we designed it, it was no restriction. So people were oh. doing the craziest things, and we would created almost 200 hypothetical observing years, wow. figured out which one took the most fuel, did that for all 11 wow, years. Wow, well, that's cool. So, so there's room. There was actually room in the tank. So that got filled up. And then, of course, we got a great ride out of the Arion folks. So we didn't spend extra fuel getting to orbit. So I believe that NASA was estimating that there's about 20 years of fuel. How much is that? 46 gallons? How much fuel is in the thing? It's a few hundred kilograms of propellant. And what are we down to now? What's what's the tank on? Is it? Is oh, I'm, I'm sure they barely touched it. If you're going to last 20 years and we're at the end of year one, so it's roughly 5%. If, if it's that much. And, and that's something that, that I know the Institute and the planners uh, look at very carefully, how to organize and schedule the observations to be the most efficient for the resources that are available. I'm, I'm certain of that. What do we learn from X-ray telescopes? X-rays allow us to see highly energetic events, so things like exploding stars and the, the envelopes crashing into gas. One of my favorite images was, was the original first light image for Chandra, the Cassiopeia A, a supernova remnant. First of all, we were able to resolve the neutron star in the center, and that's been examined in subsequent years and has been analyzed and colorized. And in that exploding supernova remnant... Are all the image, are, images colorized? Because they're yes, all like they, yes, outside yes. of... Yes, well, first of all, X-rays yeah. you know, have to be colorized to give them... In the case of the Cassiopeia A, image that I'm thinking of. They've all been colorized by the typical elements that they give off. And So you are colorizing with some knowledge of what oh, absolutely. No, this no, that, should look so, like. There is so, a reference so, so to this. The, You're not the making it up. No, no, no. The folks that do it, do it very deliberately, uh, very consistently to bring out the science content of the image or yeah. to make a point. They're taking lots of them. I don't think every image is colorized. Sure. So the ones that are released are... The uh, ones that are in focus and don't have a thumb in front of the well, lens. And that's right. That when E.T. comes and leaves yeah, his thumb little, on the lens. Yeah, that doesn't <laughs> <laughs> doesn't happen very often. But one of the things I love about the Cassiopeia A, and it's one of the backgrounds on my computer, is all the elements necessary for DNA are, cool. are in that cloud. So when you talk about the search for life, the first step is you have to have the atoms. The elements, yeah. yeah. You have to have the, the elements. There they are. It's another window into the universe, and we know more about the physics because we understand what's happening at all wavelengths, not just visible or infrared or radio or gamma rays or other Which things. is why we need multiple telescopes. Correct. It's why we need a lot of telescopes. That's why we want to eventually image the whole electromagnetic spectrum. spectrum. Yeah, right. Every layer of the onion, you're just like, okay, yeah. wait. And I, and I would certainly be remiss in not... Reminding you and your listeners that in about two weeks or a week and a half on the 23rd of July, that'll be the 24th anniversary of launch. Wow. And so we yeah, will yeah. start the 25th year of our five-year mission. That's one of my favorite things. With, um, with It's made to last for 30 days on yeah. as, as the well, opportunity is going around Mars let's, and let's, it lasts let's, for 4,000. Right. Well, and days. again, you have to design it I, I know some and of that's analyze luck. it. Well, no, it's not. 
because like I said, it's, it's, like I said it's, none it, of that's luck. It's it's it's, <laughs> it's 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 part of the condition, right? So you have to prove yeah. that something's going to last at least as as long as whatever, whatever the whatever requirement the is. Right, right. Well, this means you you make a lot of worst case assumptions, what we call conservative yeah. engineering, and in some senses, that's far less expensive because the the brains and the people are the expensive part of the mission, not yeah, the hardware. Always, always. They are large capital investments. So you do want to have that long lived, that, that value yeah. uh, to them, which is why things like Voyager have been working for yeah. 45 years. Yeah. And, and I'm going to disagree things. with you about something you just said. <laughs> okay. You just said they are large capital investments. For what we get out of them, they're I, cheap. They're, they're super they're, cheap. They're very efficient. <laughs> okay. And, and they're very cost efficient in terms of the knowledge, the inspiration, the soft power. All, all of the all of the good things that we do them for, yeah. but I also want to convey that we're we try to be as responsible as we can yeah, to the resources. I'm not saying right? I'm not and saying so that I, anyway. Uh, so if I come along and say that they're not very expensive, it sounds like I'm I'm downplaying. It I'm going to say the, I'm going to say it for you. We're going to come back. I'm going to ask Dr. Ehrenberg. I'm going to tell him something that makes me a little crazy about the space program. Okay, in, and you can in call this me John. Country. Thank you. I'm asked, John, <laughs> and you can talk me down, okay? Or don't. Maybe, okay. Maybe you don't. Maybe you agree mm -hmm. with me. Okay. All right. So we'll come back and we'll do that. All right. Great. Dr. John Ehrenberg from Northrop Grumman Space is here. He's the chief mission architect for science and robotic exploration. That is so much cooler than any title I've ever had. Ever had. And ever it will is a have. cool title. Listen, this is the thing that makes me nuts. You launched James Webb into the sky Christmas Day 2021, right? December 25th, mm -hmm. right? That's a nice Christmas for you, right? It That's got to be a good day. It was a good day. And then you take a few days off with your family. You have a little holiday. You celebrate the new year. You go back into the office on January 2nd or 3rd, whatever you do. Mm -hmm. And... Why aren't you working immediately on the next telescope? Oh, but I already was. Are you working on proposals when you go back for the next? Before there's a proposal, yeah. there's you sort of the- You gotta do the imagination part. You gotta do the imagination. There's a, a battle of ideas for what is the best science. The decadal survey settles that. They've settled it for this decade. So now we've narrowed the field down. Tell from, me what the decadal survey is. Explain So the decadal me. survey is, is the science community, literally hundreds of scientists, formed into panels to evaluate what is the most important scientific questions Where in Where can we most effectively astronomy. spend our money? Correct. If we could answer what, you know, what are the most important questions facing the, the field? And what do you have to do to get a decadal vote? Uh, you have to be selected by the National Academy to How get on How many people? This. How many people are in, in the organization? Probably tens to hundreds of people. There's lots of panels and committees and subcommittees, and they all tear up to a steering committee that's a couple of dozen, and the, they're the ones that write the final report based on inputs from all those hundreds of people. They compile it. But it truly is the community consensus about the most important. So it's truly the voice of the, the yeah. end user or the customer. But even then, you don't necessarily have funding for it. This is the part that actually is making me crazy. That's it's, it's the fact that true. The, we don't have just a constant flow Let's allocate, yes. what do we need? A couple billion dollars? It's not a lot. For, for every, astronomy? Let's just say yes. every year. Yes, that would, would, that that would be very would helpful. Would that fund everything we need? No, I think... I'm just saying it's a small amount of money. Why, why right. is this? NASA is one of those few parts of the discretionary budget that gets fought over all the time. But, yeah, but yeah. this is the part that where, where yeah. you can yes. really advance humanity. Yes, absolutely. Like you said, compared to the rest of the budget, relatively... Positively cheap. Relatively cheap. Yep. Yeah. These missions have long gestation times. I, I told you the story about my first day at work. Yeah. That was in May of 1989. The guy that left to run a study, that study became James Webb. Oh, wow. Okay. These are very long development cycles. They take a lot yeah. of consideration, reconsideration, analysis, reanalysis, reimagination. You have these enormous brains that we've invested an incredible amount of money and effort into. And if there's any time where you are not able to work at full speed or the people you work with are not able to work at full speed that's expensive that's actually expensive that's right so the fact that we can't leverage all of the investment back to the economy if you will right is a lost opportunity and the cost of that opportunity is huge that's right but it's it's very hard to calculate I only get so, so many years out of out of out of dr john Ehrenberg. that's right and any time wasted is unrecoverable that's right and yeah. it's not just me it's no, no, my of course, of course but you know what my, i mean but it's the hundreds of yeah. colleagues yeah. Of course. That, that represent this substantial 
digital body of knowledge, this corporate knowledge, I, if you I will. I need you all working at full speed mm -hmm. all the time. And training the next generation. Correct. So how is how is Webb unlike previous space telescopes? You talked about, obviously, its deployability. So it's it's deployable. It's it's much lighter. So we were talking earlier about Hubble. Hubble is basically 11.1 .1 metric tons. Mm -hmm. James Webb at, at launch was about six and a quarter. Wow. If you do the math in your head, it's about 15 times more efficient, specifically. Remarkable. We're taking a, a square meter of telescope to space. Is there a Moore's Law of Resolution? Let's see. There's an ever-increasing demand. Of course. Of course. Of course. Uh, well, for, Moore's for Law. Science. People aspire to uh, reach it. Right. In, in the case of Moore's Law, it's kind of, you know, you build it and they will, they will come. Yeah. You know, we are always looking for more efficient ways to to be more efficient. To but, see more. But there's no natural progression. It's, it's. Uh, I, I did mention the slope in the largest yeah. telescopes yeah. Yeah. in the world. And, and actually, we're kind of on it. So maybe there is a little bit of a Moore's Law, but that changes with, with the technologies of how to realize these telescopes. So that hasn't flattened out as you've gotten to multi-segment mirrors? It's continuing. No, I mean, if you, if you look at on the ground, Keck, and on the large telescopes that are planned for later uh, this decade and later in the century they all lie on a on a pretty wow. clear line that has an interesting pull on space telescopes because the first rule of getting money for a space telescope is you can't do the work on the ground as the ground telescopes get more and more competent and capable that pushes the the, the space telescope so there is actually if you want to think of it a, a demand pull for ever larger more sensitive instruments in space. how does how does an earthbound infrared telescope even work it seems like you're well, hit everything in the atmosphere. That's true. There are certain wavelengths where that rule is very easy to apply, right, like right. you can't do it from the ground. Of course. X-rays are a classic example. There was no x-ray science in the era of Galileo because you needed to get out of the atmosphere. So right. it's, yeah. it's very much a 20th century, 21st century study. Some infrared you can do from the ground. Some of it you got to go to space for. Some visible you can do from the ground. Some of it you got to go to space for. And so that's part of this early mission design. What are the strengths of the systems? What can be done on the ground so you yeah. don't do it in space? And that's always changing. So this is part of this early mission formulation that we're doing now. What's made Webb unique for Northrop? I mean, obviously, that's a probably a long list. But. So it, it's the ability to apply a number of different technologies. Obviously, the large membrane sun shield is a yep. singular uh, advantage. Developing the systems to, to manage the complex system and model the performance is a significant advancement that we use throughout all of our products, very yeah. complicated products for our customer. The testing of it was, was meticulous, uh, but it, it's in family with things we've done yeah. for, for our yeah. other customers. So it's, it's very much a Northrop-like uh, product in its complexity, its, its need to work when delivered and, and deliver on its promise. And, yeah. and uh, very much when I get interviewed on, on launch day or thereafter, you know, my, my tagline or my quote was, we kept our promise. We had been yeah. promising yeah. ourselves, the customers, the users, the taxpayers, humanity, that this telescope was going to work. And yes, it did. It could have blown up on the launch pad. That's part of the business. And that's 30 years of work just up in smoke. And then are you comfortable going in the next day and saying, okay, let's start the next one? Yeah. I mean, I mean that's part of the to. business. You it hasn't to. happened to me, but I certainly grew up on those stories. Right. But no one should feel any shame if that happens. You pick up and you start the next no, day and you, you gotta, go again. That's the nature of the business. It, you have to be unafraid. You can't be paralyzed by that fear, right? Which is why some people are drawn to this business or certain parts of the business and other people aren't. Like any super team, right? You, you get you get people who are attracted by the necessary skills to achieve that job and they, they get it, whether yeah. it's a, a group of Navy SEALs or a group of engineers or a group of super doctors or a group of super lawyers or whatever. And I think those teams all have that similar dynamics. So I've found my found my niche. What else is that L2? So these five points called the Lagrange points orbit together around with the Earth. So what that does is that orbiting allows the sun, orbiting the, the sun Earth. with yeah. the Earth. There are other satellites. L2 is actually a very large area. Our, our orbit is about five hundred thousand by eight hundred thousand kilometers so it's not crowded like low earth yep. orbit so the l2 orbit 94 million miles from the sun if, if if it was just dropped into an arbitrary point would orbit in 374 days and eventually drop away because of where it is it orbits basically 365 days same orbit period as, as the earth and that allows to easily phone home the earth is in the same place basically all the time we have an orbit with no eclipses, so we have full sun, full power all the time, constant environment. The, the sun shield is high attenuation, it's not infinite. And the, the little thing that most people don't mention, because it's subtle physics, is it's not, L2 is not stable. Yeah. So unless you maintain the orbit, 
eventually you you drift away. This is what the extra fuel is for on board. Does that keep you in LTL? The fuel is for managing momentum and for station keeping. So yes, those two things, but the station keeping is relatively small compared to the momentum. So if you look very carefully, there's that little funny sail at the end of the sun shield. Uh And that's for what we call the, the aft flap or the trim tab. And that was for balancing the center of pressure with the center of gravity to maximize that fuel usage. Wow. Amazing. Part of, I'll call it the web revolution, is the so-called passive cooling. The very iconic, I would say beautiful sun shield is the difference. It creates uh, essentially a primordially dark shadow that the telescope lives in. The orbit allows us to, to hide the brightest objects in the sky, the three brightest, the sun, the earth, and the moon. It's light pollution that we sure. need to keep yeah. away from the telescope. Other light, if it were to come over, it would heat things up. It's, it's easy just to say don't. Right. It's the simplest analysis. If it doesn't happen, I don't have to worry about it. So we keep the sun, the earth, and the moon hidden by the by the sun shield. No eclipses, so we don't have to carry a big battery. It was saving weight. In fact, Webb was only on its battery for 45 minutes in its whole lifetime. Wow. Why was it on its battery for 45 minutes? Because you have to disconnect from ground power, and during powered flight, the solar array to can't be out. stay alive during the... During the flight. During the powered flight. And then as soon as we separated, if you look at the beautiful Arion movie from the rocket cam, you'll see the first thing that comes out is a solar array. Once we did that you're good to go that was good that's when i got up and went to bed now looking to the future tell me about habitable worlds exoplanets in general astrophysics this is the the exoplanets are planets that are not in our correct in uh, in our solar system or orbiting other stars its prime mission is to characterize 25 earth-like extrasolar planets so one of the first things we have to do is okay how likely are they how many stars do we have to survey how big a telescope so the decadal has made a a guess at what that might be but we got to go and do the details and use the newest science to go identify that and also to do general astrophysics of a groundbreaking nature and so that's the general objective committees are being formed and and people are doing these very early what are called prephase a studies and you're looking literally for life we're looking on f- planets outside of our to, solar system we're looking to characterize the environments i'm going to be very careful how i, yeah. I, no, no, I say this. you're looking for water you're looking for you're looking to do you're looking to examine the characteristics and the environment of these planets and i will leave it to the specialist to say whether that proves they are habitable or inhabited yes because that is a very very subtle distinction and a very big claim that requires, depending on who you talk to, you know, extraordinary proof. Yeah. Examining that kind of question and what kind of equipment do you need yeah. to answer that and how complete, that's all the kinds of things that are, are going to be going on for habitable worlds for the next 10 years. Yeah. Tell me about what's next for you. And we're working on a couple of x-rays and an infrared a proposal and those proposals will go in and they'll get, NASA will make a selection and hopefully we're one of the selected teams for one of, at least one of those missions and we'll go off and work on that. You do, uh, speaking at UCLA and you mm-hmm. do and you do science fair stuff, so I was going to ask you, yeah. you see a lot of students. The future's bright, right? Absolutely. They're different than my generation. Different doesn't mean but better or worse. you want them to be. Absolutely. You, you want them to be. Well, they're a product of their time, just like yeah. I, I am and, and everybody else is. They're creative, have the same attitudes of, yes, I can help. Yes, I can do it. How hard can this be? And so I'm I'm very optimistic. All right, we have to get out of here, but quickly before we go, Dr. Ehrenberg, have you seen or read anything good this week? Actually, I'm reading a, a fascinating biography of an old engineer, John Hubolt. Known for what? How would we know? He was the person who argued for the lunar orbital rendezvous, which was ultimately the architecture that landed Neil Armstrong on the moon. Wow. Oh, and wow. it's particularly important because that was not the prevailing idea of the management and he stuck to his guns. I'm reading the story of his courage, professional and otherwise, in proffering this solution as the right answer to get Neil and Buzz on the moon but to meet President Kennedy's challenge. So that's that's what I'm currently reading. Very cool. The time went by too fast, but that's the episode. Thank you for joining us for all this nonsense, a truly terrible podcast from The Awful Company. Visit us on the web at nonsense.productions. I'm CJ Little. I'm Jeff Parker. I'm John Ehrenberg. If you like this program, please follow, download, subscribe, and like at Apple and Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or our favorite, Overcast, wherever you get your podcasts from. Podcastindex.org. Special thanks to our floor director, Josh Niv. Thanks, Josh. He's our favorite Clippers and Angels fan. And thank you again to Dr. John Ehrenberg. We could not be more grateful for you stopping by. Thank you for the opportunity. And another thank you to Connie Chestnut and Ron Niv for making it all happen. Been a lot of fun. We'll be here every Thursday morning for more nonsense. Join us. STEM has been at the root of the advancement of the American economy for 200 years. Yeah. Yeah. This is not new.